welcome to Seattle Revival Center. Um, goodness gracious, this, week, this weekend has been a lot of fun. Um, uh, Steve Swanson has been with us all this weekend, along with Bonnie Schaub that came in. Joshua Mills was scheduled to be with us, and then Revival broke out in a small town outside of Toronto. So Joshua called and said, hey, I don't think I'm going to make it to the meetings. Uh, uh, would you be willing to release me? And so we released him with less than 12 hours notice. Uh, Bonnie Shavda, which is Mahesh Shavda's wife, uh, said yes and flew into Seattle. And, uh, and, and she not only uh, uh, held the fort down, man, she just, she, she, she just released uh, uh, just a beautiful word on expectation, identity, and destiny, and expectation. That was just the last two nights. And then tonight, uh, we're just going to go for it in the place of just worship. Uh, Steve Swanson's just going to be leading us tonight uh, and to worship. Uh, and then we're just going to release him just to go wherever he, he wants to go and just, just to minister. And uh, So it's just going to be a lot of fun. So uh, if you got plans tonight, uh, go ahead and cancel them. And we'll see you here, uh, at, uh, we'll see you here at, at 7. Is that good? And then um, here's one thing that's so cool. I just realized this. So uh, like during the last six months since we've been hosting revival meetings, um, we, we only really had uh, one kind of female speaker with us. And, uh, and um, without even trying, we got this incredible lineup of just fiery women of God and women of faith. So Bonnie Shavda was with us this weekend. Miranda Nelson, who's just like this crazy fire. That's Jeremy Nelson's wife in San Diego at the San Diego Revival. She'll be with us next weekend. Um, we also have um, uh, Katie Souza coming in. We also have uh, Donna Shambach, which is R.W. Shambach's daughter, coming in to do a weekend of meetings with us. And so we have all these just incredibly fiery women of God that are going to be coming in uh, over the next three months. It's going to be incredible. So bring your daughters, your granddaughters, and just be declaring over them, look, you can preach the gospel, you can pastor a church, you can change a nation. Um, if a dude can do it, you can do it, uh, because we believe in women in ministry. Why? Because of the Bible, <laughs> right? Uh, there's all kinds of prophetesses and uh, leaders and elders and pastors in the Bible. Um, and so, uh, I, 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 and my pastor is a woman. Yep, and that's a long story. You can read about it in my book, right? But um, uh, Pastor Gail is just awesome. So, anyways, lots of good things coming uh, here in Seattle, and we're just so honored to be able to just host the presence of the Lord here and see what God wants to do. Isn't God good? Amen. Yeah, amen. All right, so this morning's going to be good. Uh, everyone say battle ready. Battle, battle ready. Um, the Lord wants you to be battle ready, and then he wants for you to disciple others to get them battle ready, especially when it comes uh, to your children um, and your grandchildren, and then uh, just being really on guard. And so sometimes uh, uh, life um, can get so busy and so crazy that all we end up doing is just fulfilling some sort of written like job description, right, for a living, for a paycheck, and then we just get scrambling and we just get doing, 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 doing. And how many of you know that you've been called to be more than a human doing? Amen? Right? You are a human being. Yeah, but oftentimes we don't have permission to be because we're so busy doing. And in all the complexity of just living life and in all the busyness and everything that's going on, um, we forget that, that there is actually an enemy who hates our, our, our guts. In fact, I'll say it this way with a little bit more grace. There's actually a, an enemy that hates your stinking guts. <laughs> So, and, and that just seems so unfair, right? Because, like, like we're, just trying to, we're just trying to be responsible. We're just trying to be moral. We're just trying to obey the Ten Commandments. We're just trying to be good husbands, fathers, good wives and mothers. We're just trying to do our thing and just trying to be responsible and recycle and, and not kill the planet and do all this stuff, you know. Like, and, and meanwhile, there's like, this, there's, like, this crazy lion that is, like, roaming around looking to kill us. Like, like th that doesn't seem very fair, does it? And so... Uh, <laughs> No, that's not fair. And, and oftentimes we forget that there is um, an enemy who hates us that wants to steal from us, uh, kill us, and destroy us. And we forget about that until we see one of our own taken out. It's like, uh, it's like, like we're, in the we're in the herd of elephants and like we just, we're just enjoying the oasis and life is great until all of a sudden, you know, where, seriously, where did Carl go? Guys, there's no Carl, so relax, okay? But it's like, um, uh, when you lose one of your, <laughs> you guys, some of you are getting really bummed out about Carl, but no, there was no Carl, he was not aware, that's my weird sense of humor, I, I think I'm funny and not, I'm so, um, 
we get this sobering reminder when you do see the enemy going after your son, when you do see the enemy going after your daughter, when you do see a, a, a minister of the gospel that lived his life um, with, with years of a great track record, that, that lived leadership well, that lived life well, and then all of a sudden you see them taken out by that, that lion, by that enemy, by that lying uh, 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 person, Satan, who hates us, who wants to destroy us. And oftentimes we forget about these realities until we see somebody um, who we saw as radically mature and, and, and advanced in the gospel, and all of a sudden they get taken out, and then, then you have a choice to make. And the choice is to, say, uh, is to point our finger and to judge them and say, oh, I knew that there was something off. Right? And to engage with that political spirit and to start, so start saying, yeah, I knew they were off, I knew that, blah, blah, blah. Um, or or we, what we can actually do is we can actually look at that and be humbled by that and say, oh my goodness, if it happened to that dude, if it happened to that gal, it could happen to me. And there can be this sobering reality that, like, that, you're, that, that, um, that we uh, uh, really need each other and we're not indestructible and that uh, outside of Christ, we're not supermen or superwomen. Like outside of him, like we're very, very vulnerable. And here's what the enemy does. The enemy comes to get us to engage with religion and to engage with our own ego and our own pride. So all of a sudden, one day we wake up, and even though we still have the, 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 the phraseology or the theology, we actually uh, end up becoming more religious than relational. And we actually fall out of him so that we're no longer with the, with the pride, we're no longer with the tribe, but we've become isolated, now we're a target to the enemy, and we're talking about this stuff so that we can be battle ready. Everybody say battle ready. Because when we start talking about stuff, then we can begin discerning stuff, but it's important that we're not ignorant. Ignorance may be bliss, but that's what will get you eaten. You know, when you forget that there are lions and you're just with all the other elephants drinking out of the pond, when you forget that there is an enemy, when you forget that there is a predator, and Satan is a predator, and there is a devil, and he hates you, and he hates your family, and he wants to destroy you. And I'm not saying that to freak you out. I don't, I don't talk about this stuff. You know that. Like, I don't, I don't talk about the enemy. I don't talk about demons. In the, I don't put up charts, you know, teaching demonology. And, you know, and this kind of demon has six horns and, and lives on the planet Quadar and comes to Earth through a Neptune portal like like I don't even know what I'm talking about right now like that like that's so you know me like that's not me but I feel like um, uh, uh, it is my responsibility just to just to get us to remember that um, that there is a very real battle not so that you will be terrified not so that you'll engage with the spirit of fear but that you'll be battle ready that you'll be ready so that when the enemy comes after you, you can come back at the enemy and bum him out with the word of God and who you are in Christ through the word. Because that's how Jesus battled the enemy. But not only that, because it's not just about you. Everyone say, it's not just about me. It's about my family. And it's about my tribe. Yeah, and, and we are done. We are stinking done with seeing the enemy come in and take out our cubs when we're sleeping. All right, no more sleeping. We are done with losing sons and daughters in the church. We're done with that. I want to say we're done with that. Why? Because we are waking up. When we say the spirit of awakening, man, we're not talking about um, just meetings. We're not talking about just another service. What we're saying is that our spirit man is coming alive, that we are discerning, we are hearing, we are seeing uh, God for ourselves, that we're no longer going through some sort of middle man. We're, our, our only time of connecting with God just isn't at a conference or at a service, but because of what Jesus did at a conference or as a service, now I am so alive, now I am so alert, now I am so sharp, I'm so seeing in the spirit, I'm hearing in the spirit, and when the enemy comes to town, I'm picking it up, I'm getting on the phone, I'm calling this person, I'm calling that person, it's time to pray, it's time to pray for Seattle Revival Center, it's time to pray for Pastor Darren, it's time to pray for Merlin and Karen, it's time to pray for the whites, it's time to pray, it's time to pray, it's time to start praying for the media team, oh we got this event coming up, we need to be covering um, 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 just the, the, the internet, I see, you know, the, the, but, but that we are discerning, we're seeing, we're hearing, and that we're not being ignorant, but that we know there's a real battle and it's not only just for us and our tribe it's for this world that God so loves Amen. 
and that there is a call to engagement. There is a call to enter into the conflict. There is a call to look outside of our own needs, our own desires, our own wants. And there's a call to leave our comfort zone and our holy bat and our whole uh, our little bubble place. And a call to step outside of that place in Him. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is kind of everywhere right now. There's a, there's a revival waiting to happen uh, 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 in all these kind of places, but there has to be instigators and catalysts of revival. There has to be people that will be the spark, that will go. You see, the Holy Spirit is a person, but he's also like gas. And all it takes is a spark. All it takes is an obedient son. All it takes is a person that will show up and be the spark. Guess what? Holy Spirit's like, I'm in the air. You be the spark. This thing will ignite. This thing can blow up. You don't have to have your degree. You don't have to go to seminary. You don't have to be part of an apostolic alliance. You just have to be a covenant son, a covenant daughter. You just have to know who you are in him. That you can just simply hear and speak. And you'll be faithful to obey. And guess what? God will show up. He'll show off. He'll do crazy things through you. He will do crazy things through you. Absolutely. And we say battle ready. So I want you to turn in your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 7. This is a, uh, uh, a crazy text. I've never preached out of this text before. I was studying this last week. Um, I, I did some stuff online regarding this. Um, I didn't want to. I wanted to do something a, a, a little bit different. And the Lord just said, look, you got to hit on this. And then when I was praying about Sunday, I just felt like I was supposed to hit on this again. Just to talk about it. Talk about this stuff. So that we can be more discerning, more on guard, more battle ready. Not only for ourselves, but for each other. So that we can really hold each other accountable. Really be praying for each other. Declaring victory over, over each other. Um, so that we're not stumbling in the darkness like blind fruit bats. But that we're... Um, I don't think bats stumble, but who knows? I never studied them. But anyway, so go to Proverbs chapter 7, um, and we're going to be in um, verse 1. It is kind of a funny picture, like blind fruit bats all stumbling around and stuff. So this is Solomon, and I want you to picture um, this very, very wise um, father um, sitting down with his son. And I, I want you to hear the affection um, in his heart, okay? This, this isn't like a, a, a rule ma maker. This isn't just like some sort of taskmaster. This is a, a loving father who wants to see his son do life and do life well, um, who wants to see his son uh, victorious. And, um, and here's this wise king sitting down with his young prince, um, knowing that this young prince is going to one day uh, rule and reign. Um, and he knows that there is an enemy who wants to sabotage that son's destiny. Um, and, and the wise king is saying, look, I'm going to speak on this so that you will be aware, um, so that you can guard your heart. Amen? So this is what the king says. My son, keep my words and treasure up my commands with you. Keep my commands and live. Keep my teachings as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your finger. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you're my sister. And call insight, your intimate friend. To keep you from the forbidden woman, from the adulteress with her smooth words. And then he goes into kind of this, uh, into this picture. And this picture is absolutely, um, this parable that he tells is, um, is, uh, is very uh, provocative. Um, and now, let me say this, like through immature lenses or through um, uh, 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 lenses of foolishness, um, you could look at this and say that he, what he must be talking about is gender and beware, young man, of woman. Okay? But as we read this, um, this, is, this is not a warning to young men about, um, about careless women. Um, this, in fact, has really nothing to do with gender. It has everything to do with uh, just the, the craftiness um, of seduction and how the enemy goes about planning and strategizing and how to take out young men and young women. All right? All right, let's go. Verse 6. For at the window of my house I have looked out through my lattice and I've seen among the simple and I've perceived among the youths the young man lacking sense, passing along the street near her corner, taking the road to her house in the twilight in the evening at the time of night and darkness, and behold, the woman meets him. She is dressed as a prostitute, wily of heart. She is loud and wayward. Her feet do not stay at home, now in the street, now in the market. And at every corner, she lies and waits. She seizes him and kisses him. And with a bold face, she says to him, 
I had to offer sacrifices, and today I've paid my vows, and now I've come out to meet you, to seek you eagerly, and I have found you. I've spread my couch with coverings and colored linens, with Egyptian linen. I've perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until morning. Let us delight ourselves with love, for my husband is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. He took a bag of money with him. At full moon, he will come home. With much seductive speech, she persuades him. And her smooth talk, she compels him. All at once, he follows her. As an ox goes to the slaughter, or as a stag is caught fast till an arrow pierces its liver, as a bird rushes into a snare, he does not know that it will cost him his life. And now, O oh sons, listen to me. And be attentive to the words of my mouth. Let not your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray in her path. For many a victim has she laid low. And all her slain are a mighty throng. Her house is the way to Sheol, going down to the chambers of death. And it's like Solomon is saying, Son, I, ha I have this big plan for you. I have this kingdom for you. And you need to know that there is a real enemy who's after your destiny, who's after your inheritance. Now let me talk to you guys. There is a destiny in store for you. There is an awesome plan of God. God loves you and has an amazing plan for your life. But there is an enemy and he knows the desires of your heart and, uh, and he knows the frustration and he comes to exploit those desires. He comes to exploit that frustration within your life. And if you're here today and you're frustrated and you've been sitting on things and there's, there's disappointments and there's, uh, there's all this kind of um, uh, uh, stuff happening within your heart and, and you, can, you can hear the snake in the garden saying, did God really say that you could not engage with this? Did God really say uh, um, uh, and, and if you're here today and you're hearing the snake in your garden, you're not evil, you're not bad, even Jesus was tempted, but you need to know that sometimes the snake gets in the garden, and today we're going to talk about what that looks like, how he gets in, and then how to kick him out of the garden, right, so that we're not tolerating that lying, deceitful, ugly thing, amen? All right, all right, so let's talk about um, ways that the enemy gets into our garden. And ways um, that the enemy comes to wage war on us. The first thing is disappointment. Everyone say disappointment. Unforgiveness. Everyone say unforgiveness. And hope deferred. Everyone say hope deferred. These are areas within our heart where perhaps you thought you were marrying um, Prince Charming and instead you married um, uh, not Prince Charming. <laughs> Hollywood, you married Shrek. Thank you. Um, Hollywood tells us this is what romance looks like, this is what love looks like, this is what marriage looks like. And if you're not properly prepared for marriage, if, you're not, if you don't properly prepare and really go through that, that process of counseling and discovery, and um, oftentimes you can go into marriage with just um, a, a false set of expectations, and then what you find is that all of a sudden life isn't living up to this thing, and all of a sudden you don't feel like the, the beautiful princess, or you don't feel like the honored prince within the castle, and now there's all this tension and all this stuff, and then guess what, in the middle of all the tension, in the middle of the arguments about the toothpaste, in the middle of... Uh, of of, 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 of the tension, all the chaos that's all surrounded by a roll of toilet paper because the water should flow over the mountain and not under the mountain. No? Yeah? I got it down now. The water goes, dudes, when you put the toilet paper in, the water goes over the, the it's a waterfall, okay? Not an underfall. So get it right, dudes. And in the midst of just kind of the weird, so it, don't, it, guys, let's just be real. I know, I know we're at church, but um, often it's the littlest things. It's the littlest things, and, and, it, can, and it can ignite within a home. I mean, I, I've seen conversations. I've had conversations. I'm a married dude, okay? Like, we have some real conversations in our house, and sometimes it's the littlest things, it, it's, it's, it's that little bit of insecurity in my heart, and all of a sudden I hear it, and I react, and, or it's something that Andrew and she reacts, and there can be just this, this, this tension, and guess, guess who shows up within the tension? The snake. 
The snake comes in. Why? Because when there is disappointment, when there's unforgiveness, when there's hope deferred, when there's these unrealistic expectations that you're putting on your spouse, the enemy comes in to say, you could have done better, you should have done better, you could still do better. And the enemy comes in uh, to begin bringing temptation and seduction. And he doesn't do it randomly. He's been thinking this thing out. He's been setting this thing up. Um, uh, uh, and, 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 and I could go even as so far as to say that the enemy got you to put the toilet paper in the wrong way in the first, but I won't go there, right? It's the littlest thing, and it can spark these massive conversations that are way bigger. And before you know it, you have couples that are using the D word. The what are you just divorce? How do we go from toilet paper to divorce so quickly? Because it wasn't quick. The enemy's been working. He's been uh, subtly lying to you, and, and he brings these lies. He brings these beliefs. And I know I'm being kind of silly, but you guys know that what I'm talking about is truth. Any of you that's ever been married or is married right now, and for those of you that are about to get married, oh, heed my word, young one. Uh, um, and the enemy comes in and here's where that can lead it can lead to the dream realm or the fantasy realm another open, another open gate another door by which the enemy can get into your garden I'd say the fantasy realm in that um, this is very very big within women and with men um, uh, uh, and I would say uh, you, uh, the, the church has always picked on romance novels in the past right with women like women like their romance novels it's and, um, but really, I would say the greatest uh, engagement right now for men and women for the fantasy realm is on TV. And, um, and I'm not going to pick on any sort of specific shows, but um, uh, my wife and I, we watch TV. And, I, and I, I've, I've just been so surprised um, by, the, the, by the number of times that the word sex is used in a TV show, in just one episode, and how flippantly it's used. Because the world has no grasp of the holiness and the spirituality and what sex actually is. Now, if you don't know what sex actually is, let me tell you, sex is worship unto the Lord or worship unto something else. But sex is worship. It's absolutely spiritual. It's the intermingling of souls. The occult knows the power of sex, which is why sex is used in cultic worship. Even within Sodom and Gomorrah, sex was used as a way to open up portals within the demonic realm. It all involves seed trading. When you look at even the homosexual kind of thing, and I know uh, this is a, a touchy subject, um, but uh, there are whole cults in Seattle, because we, uh, uh, we know of people that have come out of these things that have gotten saved and they can tell you about just this subversive demonic thing and how sex is used to, so here's the thing it's the intermingling of your mind your will and your emotions you become one flesh and if there hasn't been a covenant vow that's been made before the Lord then you're doing life outside of the rhythm of God and if you've done that um, there's then it's easy it's easy to, uh, to, to, to get free and I'm not condemning you but I do want to say this um, that the world has no grasp of sex sex as worship, the holiness and the purity and the beauty, it's used as this flippant, manipulative thing, and it's everywhere, and it's seeding things into atmospheres and into Christian homes where, where you're, you're just watching something, and you think you can spit out the bones and eat the meat within a TV show, but when all you're getting is just bone, 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 at a certain point, you can't spit those bones out anymore, and before you know it, your stomach's full of bones. And this is happening within the church. There's so much compromise within the church where we think we have the maturity and the wisdom to be able to handle uh, 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 sin and that I can, I can have a certain amount of compromise within my heart and I can engage with a certain amount of compromise and, it, and, it, and it's okay. But the problem is, is that this stuff is very, very spiritual. It's very, very demonic and it's not just about you. It's coming after you. It's coming to set you up, but it's coming to destroy you. And that's what Solomon says. The, 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 the craziest part part of, of Proverbs chapter 7 is the very end um, where, where, where he uses all of the, these analogies. It's like an ox. It's like a blind ox um, thinking that he's about to live the best day of his life. That's, it, that's what an excited ox looks like. Little does he know he's being led to the slaughter. He's about to die. It's like a stag. That's going really, really fast. It's fast. Heck. Wow. And it's caught fast. Bam! Till an arrow pierces its liver. It's like a bird rushes into a snare. A bird. Tweet, 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 tweet. So pretty and peaceful. Tweet, 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 tweet. And 
That's what Solomon says. And, and here's the thing, that when we allow these kind of things, when we allow this, because it is a spirit that's within the world, and this spirit has been engaging with the church so much so that, um, that, that, uh, that we have evangelical churches in Seattle that are now hiring gays and lesbians to be a part of their staff. Are you tracking? Where uh, in the same Bible that Paul is saying, if you, you're not even allowed to eat lunch at McDonald's with another believer who professes to know and love Jesus but is in sexual immorality. So if you can't even order number four with no pickle or onion with a believer who says they love Jesus but they're in rebellious sin against God, if you can't even eat number four with one, then how can you hire one to be in covenant relationship on your team? So the enemy comes through these places, through disappointment, through unforgiveness. All of a sudden you got this, yeah, my husband really is this, my wife really is this. All of a sudden you're watching TV. All of a sudden you get all these bones that you're eating without even realizing it. Um, there's also the dream realm. This is another way that the enemy can come in. All of a sudden you have a dream. It just comes from out of nowhere. We've had good people in this church that have been sober for years, off of clean, uh, off of drugs and alcohol and whatever else. They have one dream where the enemy comes in the dream. In the dream they're high. And they experience all the, uh, all the elated emotions and all their senses are heightened and they wake up and the first thing they want to do is they want to get high. After being sober for years, after going through year-long programs, after getting their children back and that they'd be willing to give it all up, why? Because the enemy came into that dream realm. And I believe that, all, that what we're talking about is, is open doors, open places that when we're not battle ready, we begin uh, opening up little doors, little places, unforgiveness. We begin engaging with TV shows. We begin engaging with pornography. We begin engaging with atmospheres. We allow the enemy to come through all of our eye gates with just a little bit of this through my eyes, a little bit of this through my ears. And here's the thing, a little bit of this through my senses. Like the, the, even smells can trigger uh, things within your, within your senses that, that'll get you all, all. So the enemy can use smell and fragrance and sight and, and all these things. To come, in through your, to come in through all these different gates. But if you're battle ready, if we talk about this stuff, if you know that you can walk in victory, which, by the way, did you know you can walk in victory? Because there's a lot of weird, weirdo stuff that's being taught in the church right now that says that you can never be absolutely free. But guess what? That's hogwash. Hogwash. Ha, 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 hogwash. <laughs> if Jesus can't set you free, then he's not God. If God can't set you free, then he's not God. If you're going to have to walk in torment for the rest of your life, then he's not God and he doesn't love you. But if he is God and he is all powerful and you call on the name of the Lord, guess what? You will be saved. You can't call on the name of the Lord without being saved. It's impossible. You cannot cry out to God and Him not show up. Why? Because He is faithful. He's faithful. He is faithful. He's faithful. And we talk about it. I don't you mean I don't have to put up with this for the rest of my life. No. You mean I can be free? Yes. You mean I can have a clean mind? Yes. You mean I don't have to sin? No. I can make a choice to not sin? Yes. There's actually a spirit called self-control? Yes. And here's the other thing, that people that are engaging with deliberate, rebellious sin, okay, I'm not talking about, for those of you that are, that are struggling and every now and then you mess up and, and you feel so like, oh, I just want to make a right, Jesus, I'm so sorry, you tear your shirt, and you put on Michael Lloyd Smith album, I'm not talking to you, I'm, I'm talking for those of you that you say, this is who I am, this is what I do, God still loves me, you have to put up with me, this is this sin, it's just who I am, this is what I do, um, th this is what I'm talking about. People that just take on their identity within their sin, they create atmospheres. They create atmospheres. And those atmospheres tattletale on the experiences and beliefs that they hold. So you can walk into a home, and you can walk into even a church. You can walk into a place, and you can sense when something isn't right. As the atmosphere begins to tattle on certain things that are accepted within that culture, or even celebrated within a culture. And that's why it's so dangerous. That every time we turn on our TV, our TV is creating an atmosphere in our home. Our TV is dictating. It gets to decide at any point 
what information, what manifestation of some sort of agenda is going to actually manifest within our home. And then we think we have the maturity to be able to cipher, you know, through poop in order to find maybe a little bit of corn that we could eat and keep in our stomach. That is absolutely disgusting. I should write my own book of Proverbs. Son, <laughs> quit playing in the poop. But what if what I was saying was true? What if there was something to this? And what if what the Lord is doing is he's awakening something in our hearts where holiness is going to matter again? And purity is going to matter again? And, and his beauty is going to matter again? So that we don't have to be mean and judgmental. We don't have to be condemning and shameful. But that as we are who we are with the Lord, people just want to make things right. I think that when people hung out with Jesus, they just wanted to be better. They just wanted to be more right. I think that when people hung out with Jesus, they just wanted to live a holy and beautiful and pure life. And I think this is what the Lord is doing in the church. He's allowing for us to, to talk about stuff without being shamed by stuff. Um, because he so loves us. He is so in us. You are so beautiful. You are so whole. You are so pure in Christ Jesus. And he wants for you to know that so that you can actually begin to manifest that. Because you won't really manifest those things that you don't really know about. Yeah? All right. How to be battle ready. Everybody say, and this is cool because I got, I got help with uh, Pastor Greg on this sermon today. Um, so Greg, thanks for your thoughts and your notes with this. This is really good. Everyone say, don't tolerate Jezebel. I'm going to read this to you guys. It's out of Revelation 2.20. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. Because you have tolerated that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things which sacrifice to idols. This is what Pastor Greg shared with me. I have learned that whatever you tolerate, whatever you come into agreement with, that that spirit of Jezebel begins to try to seduce you, to try to defile you in a way that it will try to disqualify you, either inwardly or outwardly, for works of ministry. This is what Pastor Greg was saying, that when you tolerate and you allow that spirit of Jezebel, that, that, that stuff that's coming to invade your mind, when, you, when, you, when, you, uh, when you're engaging with deliberate sin and these different things, that's tolerating uh, Jezebel. When you tolerate Jezebel, she comes to defile you inwardly so that there can be no ministry expression outwardly. Because if you do try to minister outwardly, you just feel like a, a powerless hypocrite, right? Putting on some sort of show, right? But if, if you choose not to tolerate her, if you'll kick her to the curb, you can live a passionate, bold, confident, audacious Christian life. The enemy will always come uh, 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 to, uh, to get you to engage with compromise so that he can assassinate your confidence in Christ. And we can be absolutely confident in Christ. Do you believe that? But not when we're tolerating. You know, it's like the story of David and Goliath. There was this giant that was full on verbally and physically abusing the Israelites. And nobody wanted to do anything about it. Like, how would you like that? If every day when you were going to go to work, you're going to get in your car and you hear, Darren, you're such a puny religious moron. You're a nobody. And one of these days when you come home from work, I'm going to cut off your head with my sword. Like, what if there was a literal giant out in front of my house and every day I had to put up with that? That's crazy. And that's what the Israelites were living under. Verbal abuse, reducing their identity, making fun of their God, and physically abusing, even whacking and killing off Israelites, and nobody wanted to do anything about it. Except for there was this boy named David who owned a slingshot that he bought off of Amazon for $15. <laughs> and he got so ticked off that he went down and got five rocks. It only took one. He shot that thing in the head killed him, and then cut off his head with his own sword. You can sit there and be like, ooh, but you know what I want to say? Jeez, yeah, my man, David, come on, 
oh, David, David, David. Just this little boy that was like, his, like his voice was cracking. He was like, you uncircumcised Philistine, right? Like, right? It's going into his freshman year in high school, right? Like, just this little scrawny, like, he takes that thing on, well, because David said, I will not tolerate, and I believe that there's a Davidic generation right now, that you're a part of a Davidic generation that would say, there are things, there are giants that have tormented my daddy and his daddy and my mommy and her mom. There is sin that's tried to define my family name, but I say enough as enough. That giant won't stand outside of my home. He won't stand outside of my son's home. He won't stand. I, I will talk with my son about some giants. I'll sit down and talk with my son. Hey, Peter, let me tell you about some giants that tormented our family name, but I killed a couple of them, and you're going to kill a couple of them, and in our family, we don't tolerate giants. We don't sweep giants under the rug. No, we kill them, and then after they're dead, we cut their heads off, and then we party with their heads in our hand. We celebrate by twirling those giants' heads, by blood stinking splattering anywhere, because we are warriors. We are not cowards. Scott, we are warriors. Revistos, you're warriors. Dailies, you're warriors. Seattle Revival Center, you're a warrior. Whoa. 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 And when you get that thought, man, that, that thought that comes at that time of the day, at that, at that time of the month, at that time of the year, when you get those attacks and you don't know anything else, that's a stinking giant. That's not you. Say, that's a demon. I'm better than that. I will settle for nothing less than God's best. Goliath, Jezebel, you're going down, 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 down. Say that. You're going down. You're going down. You're going down. What you tolerate will absolutely dominate. So number one, battle ready. Don't tolerate that seductive, that, that seductive kind of thing that would love to come into you through your eyes, ears. That would love to come into your home. Don't tolerate. Number two, celebrate your identity in Christ. Know who you are in Christ. When you wake up tomorrow morning, I have a pure mind. I have the mind of Christ. I am 100% holy. I am 100% righteous. I am so loved. I don't think in pure thoughts. I love Patricia King. Um, Patricia King, we were with her in Arizona. She's telling everybody, I don't get jet lag anymore. And people are looking at her like, what? What? You don't? And um, the truth is, what, what is she doing? She's declaring something over herself and to everybody around her. Guess what? I don't get, I don't get jet lag. What are, you, what are you telling people right now? Guess what? I don't get unclean thoughts anymore. Guess what, guys? I don't get tempted with alcohol abuse anymore. Guess what? Just begin declaring. Start telling your friends. Make it known in the heavens. Make it known in the earth. Celebrate your identity in Christ instead of putting up with the, who the enemy says that, that, that you are. You're, you're just a pervert, so you'll just be perverted for the rest of your life. No! You're just a screw up. So what do screw ups do? They screw up. No. It sucks to be you. No. Enemy's a liar. He's a snake. Kick him out of your garden. Number three, go to court. Everyone say go to court. You guys want to go to court on some things? Would the guys come? We're going to take communion. The ushers come. And maybe Steve, if you would come, that would be awesome too. You say, go to court, what are you talking about? It's Exodus 12, 12. Against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. Where does judgment take place? In a court. In Exodus 12, 12, when the Lord says this, I am the Lord, I will execute ju a judgment on all your enemies. This is taken within the context of Passover, which is the very first communion. So in the very first communion in the Bible... The Lord says, I am in my court, and as you engage with Passover, as you engage with communion, I'm going to judge your enemies. I'm going to whack some things. And this is what I want you to do. Um, as you get uh, the cup and the bread, we are going to repent for partnering with Jezebel. 
We are going to repent for partnering with those spirits that come to seduce, those things. We're going to repent for that fantasy realm that we've involved with, with that dream realm. We're going to repent for um, thinking beyond our spouse. We're going to repent for the things that we've put before our eyes, for the things that we've allowed to go through our ears, for those things that we engage with that we know stimulate us, but we say that's, that's okay because, and we come up with whatever excuse. And we're, we're not only going to repent, but we're going we're gonna to repent in the court of the Lord. We're going to come before the judge. We're going to stand before the judge, who happens to be our, our daddy. And then we're going to allow him to cover us with the blood of his son. And then we're going to ask the judge to summon those spirits before him. And we're going to ask the Lord to judge those things on our behalf. So Father, we come into your courts with thanksgiving in our hearts. We thank you that we don't have to tolerate Goliath. We don't have to tolerate Jezebel. We thank you that it's your desire, it's your will that we would be free and free indeed, that we would have life and life abundantly. And Father, I thank you for the Spirit of the Lord that's in this place that brings liberty. And Father, I thank you that you are going to break chains, chains that we didn't even know existed because they've been there, we were born into them. And Father, I thank you that, 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 that um, you're going to take us from a place of slavery to a place of sonship, and you're going to do it here in the next like two to three minutes. And that as a result of engaging with the Lord's table and a posture of faith, not a place of tradition, that as we engage with the blood of Jesus and his body, that as we engage with these elements, we believe that you are going to judge these things on our behalf and radically set us free so that we have a clean slate to begin living life and life abundantly from this point forward without that generational demonic pressure that would like to dictate to us how we're going to live. So we frame the atmosphere right now with the spirit of the Lord, with the spirit of victory. <laughs> We declare the spirit of freedom in this room. Father, we ask that every lie of the enemy, they would be exposed. That all um, shame and all secrets and all, everything that would try to keep us in a place of bondage, that would try to anchor us to past events. Father, we thank you that you're going to reveal these things so that you can heal these things. So let's do it. Let's stand to our feet. Father, we don't know what we're doing. but we do know that we're your sons and daughters. So we approach the bench. We approach the judge. And we say, Father, forgive us for things that have been set before us or things that we have intentionally put before our eyes. Forgive us for places that we've gone on the internet, places that we've gone on our cell phones, places that we've gone within books, places that we've gone within movies and TV shows. Father, forgive us for the things that we have fed to our soul through our eye gate. We receive forgiveness now. We receive that cleansing and that washing over our eyes. Father, forgive us for the things that we've allowed to come in through our ears. Radio shows, podcasts, listening to the, the different dialogue or even music, music that would trigger certain senses within us. Father, forgive us. We say our ears, they were created by you to hear your voice, to really hear from you and to really hear from people. We would ask that you would cleanse our ears. We give you our mouth. We give you our senses, we give you our touch, we give you our noses, Father. We ask that you would cleanse these things. And we repent for tolerating and partnering with the spirit of Jezebel, with that seductress, with that lying prophetess. And whatever else the Lord just brings up to mind, just, just, just repent, just say, Father, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Things that you knew about, things that you didn't know about, Father, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I turn away, I repent, I turn into you.
And now, Daddy, we ask that you would summon these giants. We ask that you would summon these spirits before your bench. And we ask that you would judge them on our behalf. Lord, on our behalf and on behalf of our sons and daughters, Lord, we ask that there would be a judgment, Lord, and that you would lift off that heavy pressure that we have been walking under for years and even decades. And Father, we thank you for your final and just and merciful judgment on our behalf today in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Mm. Oh. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had, he had given thanks, and he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake of the bread together. And in the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. Let's partake of the, of the blood together. Thank you, Jesus. I declare victory over you, joy unspeakable and full of glory. I declare you are forgiven, go and sin no more. I just declare that spirit of Christ Jesus, that spirit of self-control. I, I pray just for that sharp, keen sense of discernment that even as you begin to engage this week, that you would, you would just know, you would just know when that snake is in your garden, you would just kick him out, you know? I, I just pray that there would just be such a, such a, a sharp, keen sense that you, would, that you would know, that you would know when the battle's starting to get a little thick and a little heavy, that you would know when to call another brother, uh, you, you would know when to call another sister, that you would know when things are a little bit off, that you are sharp, you are discerning, you are a warrior, and you are pure, you are beautiful, you have permission to engage with the presence of the Lord, to go all in, he's going to use you, he's going to use you not because of anything that you've done to prove anything, but Jesus has done it all on the cross, so from this point forward, you are forgiven, you are free, you are free, you are free, you are free, your marriage is free, your sons and daughters are free, you are free. You are free. You are free. Just declare that. I am free. I am free. I am free. My mind is free. My heart is free. My heart is free. My emotions are free. My spirit man is free. I am free. I am free. I am free. Give the Lord some praise. Come on. Give the Lord some praise. We praise you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Everybody said, love you guys, love you guys, God bless you.